I have to say, it's been a while since I was at a law school classroom like this, and I think it's the first time I've ever sat in the front row. <laughs> I'm much more comfortable with those backbenchers in the crowd. Um, but you do have to worry about drawing the Socratic question uh, from time to time. That was my experience, at least. Um, before I start, I want to say a few thank yous. Thank you certainly to Professor Anita for the trust in uh, selecting me uh, with your team to deliver this uh, high privilege, the inaugural lecture. Um, and your team, of course, Jennifer and Melissa. Thank you, Dean Anita and um, Vice Provost uh, Jeffrey. And uh, thanks to all of you for coming out tonight. I also do want to do a small shout out to our visiting professionals in the room. Uh, we have folks uh, that join us from time to time for a six week program. And this year they come from China, Tanzania, Liberia, Myanmar, and India. And um, I understand they're going to be delivering their own panel next week on women's land rights. So I hope folks can come out for that. Um, so I'm controlling this, I guess. Let's see. Great. I wanted to start with a word about Roy Prosterman. Um, Roy's story is really Landessa's story. He got his start many years ago with a law review article. Uh, I think it was 1966 or so, Roy, um, shortly after graduating from law school. And that law review article was picked up by somebody in the US government uh, that saw the seed of a strategy uh, for trying to um, improved a lot in South Vietnam. And so the US government sent Roy to South Vietnam on the hopes that his strategy around land rights might be able to do something for that fledgling government there. Roy's promise was that if you gave smallholder farmers secure land rights, you could improve productivity and perhaps um, stifle the flow of recruitments to the Viet Cong. And in fact, uh, when that program was evaluated some years later, they found that it, it had indeed delivered 30% rise on productivity and an 80% reduction in recruitment to the Viet Cong. Quite a success. And uh, it was that work that really launched uh, Roy's land rights career. And he did it right out of this very program, uh, where I understand uh, at the time the motto was leader, leaders for a global common good, something that clearly Roy embodied. Uh, and he just had a handful of students, Jeffrey and others, working with him. Uh, but out of that experience, uh, they managed to build a remarkable outfit, uh, Landessa, that has now worked in over 50 countries um, with governments, corporations, civil society. Roy's done that uh, largely as an indefat indefatigable leader, uh, a dedicated uh, advocate, and ultimately highly pragmatic. And anyone that knows Roy will know that he is also supremely humble. He embodies everything that we want uh, at Landessa, and I'm sure here at the law school. 50 years ago, land rights looked very different when Roy was getting his start. At that time, land conflicts had driven great wars in Mexico, Russia, Spain, China, and Vietnam. And the discussion around land rights really involved discussions about expropriation, redistribution. Uh, they were caught up in Cold War politics. The whole environment was very fraught. And uh, you see Roy there in El Salvador with that um, helicopter, and I believe there were times when you were wearing bulletproof vests. There's Tim as well, of course, uh, his, his, his sidekick in much of this. Um, there was also very little funding. It was mostly USAID and the World Bank, and they were fickle funders. Uh, there was little or no experience. It really wasn't on the, the radar screen of civil society groups. Uh, and there weren't any pragmatic solutions. Uh, people were pushing for revolutionary solutions, and Roy was a pragmatist. So Roy really had to build a practice out of whole cloth. Uh, and he looked to, tr with, to, to use the tools of law and policy to affect deep social and economic change. And he did it by trial and error. And as he did that, he helped bring the whole land rights field along with him and with Landessa. I had my own epiphany about land rights when I joined Landessa a couple years ago. Before that, for about 25 years, I'd been working on human rights and international development, and it was work that always circled around land. So I was working with indigenous peoples in the Amazon. I was working with coffee farmers. Uh, I was working on mining issues and uh, large commodity supply chains. I was working on humanitarian relief. Um, but it was only when I really got to Landessa that I tied it all together and realized how central land really is, how foundational it is to so many of those issues. It's easy for us in the global north to not see 
how critical land is because our land systems are largely developed and largely invisible to us. We just assume uh, with a deed and a lawyer we can sell and buy and we can trust that the government will enforce that. It's a very different picture in the global south and that creates a whole world of dysfunction. Happily, land rights are now on the global map and we see signs of a revolution all around us. I'm gonna talk about 10 of those signs today. First, we have to try to understand the scope of the problem. There's three things we know about the majority of the world's poor. They're rural, they depend on land to survive, and they don't have secure rights to land, either because they don't have land or because the land they have is not protected in any kind of secure way, so they're land insecure. The best estimates say that about 10% of the land in rural Africa has now been titled and as little as 30% of land globally has been documented. Without that documentation and that security, people, farmers face a powerful disincentive to invest. If they don't feel secure about the land, they're not gonna invest in it for the long term. And that undermines productivity, livelihoods, and ultimately food security. So the first sign, oh, sorry. Our first sign is um, food security and livelihoods. Land rights helps boost investments, helps boost productivity, and ultimately uh, helps increase food security. Studies show that secure land rights have led to a 60% improvement on productivity in some cases and more than a doubling of income. In Ethiopia, when women had secure rights to land, food security increased by 36% according to one study. And in Nepal, Children of mothers with secure land rights were 33% less likely to be malnourished. Because of that, a few years ago, the largest global body dealing with food security, the UN Committee on World Food Security, spent many years drafting a set of norms on land rights of, uh, targeting governments and industry. And uh, as many of you know, the UN Sustainable Development Goals now includes land explicitly in goal number two, which is dedicated to ending hunger and achieving food security. The second sign of a revolution around lands is on sustainable economic growth. We now know that land rights are absolutely vital to macroeconomic development. Poor countries have an excess of farm labor, up to three quarters of their population in some cases. Supporting those farmers through land rights and ag extension allows the farmers to produce more, to feed themselves and their neighbors, and also to build demand for local markets. The Asian success stories, the Asian tigers, countries like Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, and ultimately China, have built their development around smallholder farmers. Their land reforms focused on small, secure plots, just like the ones that Roy was pushing in South Vietnam, and support for family farms. A global study of 108 countries found that stronger property rights led to an increased annual growth per capita in per capita income of six to 14%. And we now know that the sustainable development goals number one around ending poverty includes a focus on land rights. The th third sign of a coming revolution around land rights is on women's empowerment. The majority of women in the global south live off of farm labor. But more than half the world's countries by law or custom deny women the ability to own, inherit, or manage land. As we're sometimes told in the field, or our staff is told when they're out trying to understand these biases, we are told property cannot own property. Women typically can only access land through a male relative. They don't have control over the crops they grow, and they can lose the land if they're widowed or divorced. This condemns women to second-class citizenship. By the same token, land rights can be absolutely transformative. When I recently visited India and spoke to a group of women who had come by a small plot of land and a title, I asked them what it really meant to them, and I could see they already had gardens, their children were going to school, but what they all told me was that the primary change had been in their status, their dignity, the respect that they now gained as a land holder. That, in, that changed completely the way they were viewed by their family and their communities. Uh, it gave them voice. 
In my mind, there's no single intervention as powerful as land rights to empower women. And the Sustainable Goals number five, happily, has included land rights as part of its efforts to promote women's empowerment. There's also a number of campaigns that have taken up land rights and women's rights, uh, including a global campaign by a coalition of groups under the Women Deliver banner, and a new campaign that Landessa is helping put together uh, with a number of other NGOs. The fourth sign is on human rights. Land conflicts and violence have assumed a large part of the human rights field. Increasing conflicts around a land rush in the global south, driven by population growth, climate change, and the northern demand for food, fuel, and feed, has driven conflicts across much of the developing world. A recent study found that 93% of new concessions for extractive industries were for land that was already occupied by communities. That means that these companies that now have legal title to that land are faced with inevitable conflict with those communities. And a study of civil conflicts since 1990, all the civil conflicts since 1990, found that land, was, land conflict, land rights, were at the root of the majority of them. <coughs> Activism around these issues is increasing alongside repression. Global Witness has tracked the number of land defenders killed over recent years, and each year it grows, so that last year, 2017, almost four land defenders were killed every week, the highest year ever for land defender killings al along the lines of Berta Caceres. Human rights groups and human rights bodies have increasingly focused on land rights, where there really isn't a lot of normative work to date, but now the UN Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, for one, is starting to draft an authoritative set of land rights uh, norms under their authority. The fifth area or sign of a coming revolution is, has to do with rule of law and corruption. Skewed land holdings, insecure tenure, and land grabs breed instability and corruption. They tie up the courts and they undermine rule of law. In India, most civil court cases relate to land conflicts. Transparency International reports that land agencies are among the most corrupt in almost all developing countries. Governments and donors increasingly recognize that land tenure is critical to mature governance. And leading organizations on rule of law, including the Seattle-based World Justice Project, Nancy Ward here representing them, consider secure and accessible land rights to be a key pillar of promoting rule of law. The sixth area is indigenous people's rights. There are an estimated 2.5 billion people who depend on indigenous and community held lands. Those lands cover over 50% of the planet, but only a fifth of that land has been recognized as belonging to those communities. It's impossible to secure indigenous people's rights if they don't have strong territorial rights. I spent many years in the Ecuador and Amazon were working with many communities that had been there for uh, centuries and were now facing the prospect of oil companies coming into their lands. They didn't have secure title, and as a result, every time the companies would come in and try to negotiate with those people, the asymmetries of power made it absolutely impossible to get any kind of a meaningful agreement. And so either the, the indigenous groups were cheated out of their land, or they uh, rose up and fought against the companies, and in many cases, provoking the kind of conflict and violence we were just talking about. Territorial rights have long been at the front of indigenous people's concerns, but more recently, they've been joined by hundreds of organizations. And in one campaign, at least 500 organizations have joined uh, to promote uh, the doubling of land under indigenous and communities uh, in a campaign called Land Rights Now. The seventh sign, of a coming revolu revolution has to do with conservation and climate change. When people feel insecure about their land, they have little incentive to protect it. And on the contrary, they have an incentive to scavenge. Individual farmers with secure rights are far more likely to take the kind of climate smart measures that are now being promoted uh, by many governments, including water and soil conservation, drought resistant crops, responsible fertilizer use, and the like. 
But when we spoke to women recently in northern Ghana about the lands that were degraded by climate change, they asked us, why would we invest in our land if doing so would only increase the chances that our husbands would take it back for themselves the next year? Without that secure security around land rights, farmers don't have the incentive to adopt the kind of solutions that we need in order to protect the land. That link between land rights and climate change is even more important when it comes to collective rights. Evidence shows that community rights, collective land rights, are the best defense against deforestation. Indigenous peoples and local communities manage a quarter of the total carbon stock that's held in the world's forests, but they need the rights and the capacity to protect those forests. Forests. Happily, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change has finally established a local community and indigenous peoples platform out of a recognition of the important, ro important role they play. And similarly, Red Plus, which is the UN scheme to promote carbon sequestration, has now focused squarely on land tenure. The A sign has to do with humanitarian crises and response. Insecure land rights lead people to behave in ways that would seem unreasonable. They refuse to evacuate when they're facing environmental threats. We've seen it in many countries, including in India, where people on riverbanks that are prone to floods won't leave them. In Orissa in 1999, a cyclone killed over 10,000 people, and a third of them had stayed longer because they thought it was, a, when they heard the warnings, they thought it was a plot to evict them. The lack of title also makes it impossible for humanitarian organizations and governments to rebuild after disasters like the Asian tsunami, the Haitian earthquakes, or the recent hurricanes in Puerto Rico. In a survey of major humanitarian groups, land insecurity came out near the top of the major obstacles, both for disaster resilience and for reconstruction. And what's remarkable is I worked for 10 years at Oxfam, and I never was aware of how critical a role land played in, in our humanitarian work. But recently, Oxfam too has invested in land rights. And just two years ago, Landessa was awarded the largest humanitarian award, the Hilton Prize, which was a sign of the coming importance placed on land rights by the humanitarian community. Bringing us to our ninth sign, smart urbanization. We all know that urbanization is increasing, but city planners across the global south are stymied by a lack of secure land rights and a, sl a, a lack of effective registries. 60 to 80% of African city dwellers lack secure property rights. And that leads to illegal and unplanned urban sprawl, massive slums, forced evictions, and conflict. The UN's new urban agenda is all about land rights. And the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Housing and Forced Evictions has also taken up the banner of land rights. The world's largest housing NGO, Habitat for Humanity, has launched a global campaign around land rights called On Solid Ground. And so we are seeing the pickup on the urban fronts as well. And finally, the tenth sign has to do with peace, security, and refugee flows. Struggles over land have spurred recent wars and refugee flows in places like Syria, Sudan, Rwanda, Colombia, and Myanmar. Changing weather patterns, increasing disasters, and a land rush will all exacerbate this. It's estimated that 25 million to up to 1 billion environmental refugees uh, will be fleeing their lands by 2050. For governments, land insecurity poses a constant threat of conflict and civil war. And for the global community, it poses a threat of instability and refugee flows. So those are 10 things. What I remember about law school is you can only remember three. So we're going to group all of them into one big bucket here. And I'm just going to end with three takeaways. The first thing is that land rights is clearly on the global agenda. I've mentioned a few times the sustainable development goals. It's worth remembering that in the prior set of goals, the millennial development goals, the MDGs, land didn't appear even once. And now it's spread throughout the Sustainable Development Goals. That is, in, in some ways, the most evident recognition by the international community of the importance of land rights. But we also see it at things like the World Bank Land and Poverty Conference, which we, many of us attended last month, I guess, 
where I think there was close to 2,000 people taking part in an event that Jolene tells me was just a handful of folks when it first started um, some years ago. Land is of great interest across the international community. It's also of great interest to, the gov to various governments. Landesa is approached by too many governments than we can handle uh, to help with land reforms, most recently in places like Myanmar and in, in Zimbabwe. And in the Africa Union, there's been a commitment made that 30% of land should be in women's hands by 2025. We also see this interest amongst the business community. Businesses know that land security, land tenure security is critical to stable markets and to their security of their land investments. And they've come together to promote progressive, forward-looking land rights, which is remarkable. I spoke to a mining company recently that told me that in Suriname, they had publicly spoken to the government about the need for stronger land rights and free prior and informed consent which is sort of a remarkable th development when you think about it, that companies now have become champions of land rights. We also see it across new constituencies. The 10 signs means 10 new constituencies, environmental, women's rights, human rights, indigenous peoples, uh, <coughs> humanitarian organizations. And finally, the media is picking up on land rights. And now there's a dedicated platform called PLACE by Thomson Reuters that puts out hundreds if not thousands of articles around land rights every year. That's the first piece of good news of three. The second is that we've seen a boom in evidence, in tools, in innovations, and in resources going to land rights. We now have a strong evidence base, something that Roy really didn't have when he first started out. And data is always a challenge for us. But now we have unified indicators around land security. And we have multiple efforts to collect information through the World Bank, through the Sustainable Development Goals, and through private efforts like something called Prindex, which is also trying to understand the scope of land insecurity. We also have proven models. At Landessa alone, we've worked on evidence-based models around microplots, around grassroots legal assistance, community mapping, women's support centers, alternative land dispute mechanisms. There's a whole range of proven models now around uh, how to address some of the dysfunctions in, in land. And now there's new technology. There's mobile apps, there's drones, there's blockchains, there's global mapping systems. And finally, happily, there are new donors and resources for this work. There's even a land donors network of governments. That's the second bit of good news. And the third and final one, really speaking to many of you in the audience here, this is a great space for lawyers. It's fitting that we're giving this speech at UW, which incubated and spawned Landessa and all of the great work of Roy and his team. Land rights demonstrates a fascinating connection between law, human behavior, and international development. It's one of those arenas where you can really see how law affects both governments and populations. And finally, law provides a, an amazing opportunity for aspiring lawyers to work in what is still somewhat new terrain, using law as a tool for systemic change at the global and national level, but also tangible change at the local level. And at Landessa, this has been uh, another epiphany for me. I always thought you were either doing legal services and you get one-to-one -one contact with people or you're going for systemic change. But with land rights, we're able to work on both the government reforms and we can see those patas or land titles delivered to people uh, in person. And we can work across so many of today's most important challenges. With that, I just want to thank you and uh, invite the next speaker up here.